joining me on a quilting tale today. My name is Shaylin and I recently went to an antique store and found all kinds of sewing and quilting related goodies that I'll show you in a moment. But the main thing I was on the hunt for was something to make a pin cushion out of. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you may have already seen this pin cushion holder that I made out of a plant holder, a ceramic plant holder. And so I thought I would show you how I put it together. Um, this is a little puppy with a mailbox and the opening is where I put in a pin cushion. So I'll talk about what kinds of things you can use to fill the pin cushion, how to make it, um, and just some considerations when you are picking out a pin cushion holder, but there's lots of different antiques you can use to make these. So I'll be sure to show you some options as I was going through the antique store. I was taking pictures of all kinds of things that I thought could have made a good pin cushion in all different sizes. This one's a little larger, but I ended up finding more dog plant holders that I just thought would make a fun set. So I'll show you my antique store haul and then I'll show you how to make one of these. So the first thing I found were just some props to use with photos of my quilts um, or quilt along blocks and I was just thinking since I've been doing more quilt alongs that I should get a few more letters to spell out block perhaps because I've been doing lots of pictures of individual blocks but just found some of these old toy wooden blocks and scrabble tiles and you just pick out letters and dig through the bin so it was fun to find the different letters. These are some sample buttons that I found. I thought I could use them on the brick house quilt I'm making that I showed in one of the recent videos. I thought these would make cute doorknobs for the door portion of the blocks. I also found this jar of wooden thread spools that I thought were really cute and would also make good props for photographing blocks as they're done. They come in all different sizes. And then I found this cute metal sewing machine that I thought looked like it would be a fun decoration in my little sewing corner here. And the fun thing about this is it's actually a pencil sharpener. It's a little hole for the pencil too. And the lady at the antique store said that this is 40 years old and she was glad it was finding a new home. I also saw several versions of these sad irons, S-A-D-I-R-O-N-S, um, and a lot of them just had metal handles and then um, were a little more triangular at the base. I think those were the older irons, and then these sad irons I was reading about with the wooden handles and pointed on both ends. They were made by a 19-year-old named Mary Potts in 1871 she added this wood handle because before they'd have to put the iron down on a stove or over coals and it was very hot and you had to use a rag to wrap around the handle and it was very dangerous to iron and um, get wrinkles out of fabric and sheets and easy to scorch the fabric and um, the irons would cool down easily so they'd have to have multiple irons if they could afford them on the fire getting ready to swap out um, and so yeah just reading it sounded like the ironing was a really painful chore to do um, but that wasn't why they were called sad iron sad is an english word for solid um, also called flat irons um, and so this version that mary potts invented was in 1871 it was called mrs potts iron when it started to get manufactured and there's a little locking mechanism on here so you could lift the handle and put it on another um, hot iron that's ready to go so you didn't have to handle it as much so these irons were popular from 1876 to about 1951 i was reading Let's see if i can do that one-handed there we go so i thought they were just a cute little petite iron when I saw all kinds of them. Some of them even had color on them. Um, but reading about them gave me a greater appreciation for the electric irons we have now and they're not nearly as dangerous. So um, I again thought that this would be just a 
nice little thing to have on my sewing table or to put in pictures and just got a bonus appreciation for some of the tools and technology we have today. So the main thing I was looking for when I went into the antique store was something else to make a pin cushion out of. And just like my first one, I found this planter um, with another dog on it and he's kind of a, has the gingham pattern on him with a blue bow. It was really sweet. Um, I think it said made in, yeah, in Japan at the bottom there. And I wasn't setting out to find another dog, but just a cute plant holder. But for some reason, the dog ones just really stand out to me as cute. They're a little larger than some of the other plant holders, but I could, again, just envision a pin cushion here um, on his back and find a coordinating blue or burgundy, perhaps, fabric. And so I just thought with that sweet little face, it needed to be turned into a pin cushion to be on my table. And then I thought I was done, and I found another one. This one here was in a totally different section. And again, I'm, I'm not specifically looking for dogs, but I just thought his little bowl here would be great for holding pins or just small little notions, wonder clips or something. And then there's an opening in the back as well. Um, maybe a little spot for a plant to grow out as a tail, but um, I'm just going to make a pin cushion on his back here also. Um, and so I have two options. I might do one with the crushed walnut shells and another with a polyfill, but I just thought these were both too sweet to pass up and just leave in there. So. Um, these are both originally plant holders, and those aren't the only things you can make pin cushions out of. While I was walking around, I was taking pictures of some other items, um, some that are much smaller, that I thought would make good pin cushions too. So I'll show you some of those, but these are the ones that I just thought I would enjoy seeing them on my sewing table, and I'll just have to swap out. So let me show you some of the other things that I thought could make a good pin cushion. Really anything that has a some kind of opening on it, like a bowl or a cup, or you'll see some other examples here. cushion here, um, you're going to want quite a bit more than the opening here. It doesn't look like a really big hole that looks maybe about, I don't know, three to four inches, but you'll probably want about double that size, maybe a little more, because it's going to um, need to fold under and cinch at the bottom to hold all the stuffing. So, um, you know, a layer cake square or something about that size should be good. Um, for an opening this big, but you just have to think you're going to want it to go up and around and pull down and cinch at the bottom. So it really just depends on the size of your opening here. But I just wanted to look at some of the fabrics I pulled where I know I'd have enough fabric 
I'm going to turn him gently on his side so we can see the colors here under the light. So I pulled some that had some of these kind of burgundy colors or blue in it. And I found some that I thought like this could work has burgundy flowers and I didn't want to do a bright white background or white in it because this is more of a cream color in. Um, but some of these I thought with the cream background just like his body might not be enough contrast but these are some that I was considering that could work that have a lot of those colors. Um, I found this one that would almost be camouflage with this little pup. Um, so probably won't do that one either, but could work. And then same thing, that bag of scraps that I'm making my crayon box uh, Moda Blockhead for uh, kit with had this burgundy gingham square, but again, it probably just too similar. Um, I found this one here, this little fat quarter that I thought could work. It has these little mushrooms on it and would really stand out in here. Um, I also thought about blues to play on the bow here and I had several different shades of blue. There's that hound's tooth which might be a little too busy with the gingham print. This is a smaller kind of diamond checked print. I like that blue with his bow. I'd have to see if I have anything wider in this one. I was just pulling from one scrap tub there. Um, same thing here is a little bit lighter of a blue with teacups on it that could work or an even lighter blue with teacups. I think any of those could work. Um, this one has blue roses, which might be different enough with the checkered print here, not too matchy-matchy. Um, and then I found some that had the bit of burgundy in the background. The blue is very different, but I thought it still looks really nice with the cream in there and might be a consideration. And then I had these kind of off-white um, fabrics that just look kind of vintage with the tags and um, I think this, I don't know if this is flea market, but it has like a little record book and writing on it. Um, I also had little hearts that have those old library cards stamped on them, so they kind of have a vintage feel to them. So. I'm going to think about it before I start building, but those are some of the options that I'm considering for this guy. And then for the black and white dog, just imagine a pincushion coming out. There we go. There's this one. So either of those could look nice, or because um, the black and white goes with so much, I thought just pops of color could look nice too. So. Um, I love the bright pink and the tulips on here, um, or a really bright blue for the body here. I think that would look really pretty. Here's another really bright one. It has some birds on it. Or Another blue with bright flowers. So really, I don't think I could go wrong with any of these. I think it would just be a matter of taste and which one I would want to see on my sewing table the most. Um, I also thought because I already have some that could be, you know, any season, I could also do like a Christmassy one, and this could be my Christmas dogs. So I could try out a Christmas fabric too. So lots of options. Again, I'm going to think about them and make sure I have enough of the fabric. This one will need even more. Um, so I'm going to just think about it and then I'll pick one of them to demonstrate with, but the process will be the same for both. All right, so aside from whatever you're going to make the pin cushion out of, whatever antique or other holder you select, here are some other materials you're going to need. So you're going to want your pressed fabric that, again, needs to be considerably wider and longer than the opening, and a pair of fabric scissors. You're going to need some thread. I believe this is called crochet thread. It's a little thicker here. Um, it doesn't matter the color because it won't show. And then you'll want a needle. I have an embroidery needle here with a large enough opening for the crochet thread. 
and then you'll need a hot glue gun to put it into place. Now let's talk about filling or stuffing options next. So this bag is open upside down here. So um, for a filling, if you just want a squishy or lighter pin cushion, um, you can use the polyfill or you could use the cotton filling, just something soft and um, light here that you can stuff it with. If you want a heavier filling, whether you're doing a pin cushion like this or just um, a freestanding pin cushion, you can use crushed walnut shells. You can get this in a pet store. So it does leak out of the bag if there's even a little hole um, because it's so fine. And so I just keep them double bagged in a Ziploc bag, but you can kind of see it here. This gives it a little more weight and makes it firmer. And so that's an option. I've used these in pin cushions, uh, the crushed walnut shells, and um, I like how they look. I've heard that it can help sharpen your pins. I don't know that that's been the case for mine. If you leave them in too long, it kind of um, changes. You can feel when you're sticking the pin through fabric, it feels like it almost gets caught a little bit in the area that's been touching the um, the shells for too long. So I would just recommend not leaving them in there, you know, all the time, but make sure you're using them. It's just my experience. So I wouldn't leave them in decoratively and then go out and use them or you might realize they feel different. Um, I also heard of people using sawdust or sand or rice as a heavier filling too. So um, those are all options, but I'm going to try one with walnut shells and another with the polyfill um, just to show you the difference and if you use a fine material like the crushed walnut shells I would also suggest a bowl to do it over because they do go everywhere and um, can be messy so do it over a large bowl you might um, use a funnel perhaps um, but you'll want a little spoon for filling as well let's do the gingham dog first I'm going to just and measure the whole space here just to give an idea of how big it is. Um, otherwise I'd be eyeballing it, but it's about three inches uh, by about two and a quarter. I decided on this tea time fabric from Lewis and Irene. I just did one of my brick house scrap quilts in it and have a quilt made out of it. So I have a little left. This is a seven inch wide scrap that I cut. So that should be wide enough for my purposes here. And then um, I think I'll save the selvage edge. If you saw one of my recent videos, I was talking about using this as a record, keeping the little color palette in my journal for the quilts that I've made. So I'll use this end here. And again, if it's about three inches um, at the widest spot, I think I'm going to um, do at least twice that amount, um, maybe a little more, because you can always cut off excess or it'll hide in here, but you can't add more. So I think I'm gonna cut about, just to give you an idea, I'm thinking, I'm gonna do about 10 inches, 10 and a half or so, just to be on the safe side and know that I have enough. So about triple um, my longest portion here. Okay, so I have my piece. I've got a long piece of the crochet thread um, looped through my needle here. I'm gonna just tie off the end or make a little knot at the end. Putting it around a few times. Pulling through. There we go. This is all going to be hidden um, inside the planter, so this doesn't have to be, you know, your prettiest, neatest work here. Um, but one thing to consider is the shape of the opening. So the one I'm doing right now has a rounded shape. Um, so when I stitch around um, this piece of fabric. I wanna have it be a circular shape. The idea is that when you pull it tight, you can cinch the bag closed and it'll be um, the shape that 
you know you need it to be if I were doing this holder right here um, it has a more rectangular shape and so I would make a rectangular pattern in this and so um, I'll show you that when it's time to do that one so um, I'm gonna take my fabric and I made sure that I ironed it and just stitch around it it can be big stitches they don't have to be even or or anything but I do want to keep it not too close to the edge because I don't want anything to tear as I'm pulling it tight to cinch so maybe about a half an inch or so in um, I'm just going to and it doesn't matter if you start from the right side or the um, wrong side because like I said it's all going to be hidden but what I want to do is just go up and down um, making a round shape so I'm gonna do this a few times and then I'll probably speed it up for you okay, so I'm just gonna again think of a circular shape here It needs to have room for the filling, and so that's why we want the circle to be much larger than um, the opening, because it has to have height and have enough to cinch at the bottom. It's kind of challenging to sew a circle shape on a rectangular piece. So again, this is just a rough, um, a rough circle because you'll be able to fill it in and get more control the shape more with the filling too you can push it to the side and even out the shape So here's what it looks like close up and it might be easier to see on the darker side with that white fabric but you see it's a very messy almost oval shape and that's fine and you can also see that some parts I went much more than a half inch away from the edge because I needed a circular shape not rectangular and I can cut that away but let me show you what happens when you pull it tight. So I, I haven't tied it off or cut it or anything, but I'm just going to pull it tight and it's going to cinch. And obviously this would be too small for my pincushion, but I can get my finger back on the underside here and I can just start loosening it and pulling it apart. Um, so what I'm testing here before I tie anything off or cut off excess thread is just that I'm going to have enough of a round shape to put on the back and that it'll have some height too so it doesn't need to be cinched as tight as it can go I can stick those threads at the um, top of my opening here and just get a sense of the height if I like how tall that's going to be because this will be um, glued in in a little bit um, and hidden down inside the opening of the pin cushion so this is probably a good amount here. And again, I can take off some bulk. I want enough hanging under as well. I don't want to trim it to the thread. I want some hanging down so that when it cinches together, it can close all the way. But I do have a lot of excess right here. And I really don't have to trim it um, because it'll all be hidden and there's a big opening. But if you have a smaller um, opening, like maybe you did a little, um, egg cup or something you found that's smaller and you don't have a lot of room for excess fabric you might trim it um, but again it's really not necessary if you have a larger opening like mine but I'll just show you an example though of how I trim I just go at the corners I want to make sure I don't trim my crochet thread there okay so I still have quite a bit um, below the threads all right so now it is time for filling 
and I'm going to use the crushed walnut shells in this one. So I'm going to go grab a bowl to do this over and then I'll show you what that looks like. Again, I still have not cut the thread yet of the um, crochet thread here. One thing I also want to show you, you don't have to do this. Um, I haven't done it before, but I thought if you can't cinch your pin cushion tightly enough, if you overfill or you just cut off too much fabric, you could use a little cotton ball or these cotton rounds. These are called swispers, um, just to kind of plug the opening. So I'll try that on this one and um, see how that works. But I have some of my crushed walnut shells here. These were what spilled out of an earlier project, so I'm just going to use from the smaller bag instead of that big one that I showed you earlier. I'm just going to put my pin cushion inside like so, and then you can, like I said, use a funnel or dump, or I'm just going to spoon it full until I get the firmness that I want. You can stop once in a while and test out what it feels like when it starts to touch the thread line that's when you might start um, cinching it tighter and seeing if you like that amount all right so to test it i'm just pulling it tight here and i'm gonna try holding it with my finger so nothing gets out. I might use one of those little swispers to um, to plug it, but I just want to see for now the shape and I want to make sure it's long enough and wide enough for the opening so I can make any adjustments if I need to. I need to try and keep my finger in place so I don't lose everything, but if I just hold it up to the opening here, I can see that it's covering both sides and the length and if it's overhanging a little bit that's okay um, if it seems way too big I can empty some out or if it's too small I can kind of shape the crushed walnut shells around to try and fill out the sides more or the length but this should be good so I'm gonna put it back in the bowl here and tie it off um, I'm gonna put one of my little swispers inside just to be tucked under all the threads. I just want you to see before I cinch it closed and tie it off. All right, so I'm pulling it tight. I'm gonna hold it with my finger here. And then I might wrap it around the thread a little bit just to, as an extra layer here of tightness. You can see I didn't quite catch that piece. So what I'm gonna do, cause it's still threaded on the needle. So I'm gonna just go up through the thread. Doesn't matter where, just watch your fingers. And again, I'm pulling as tight as I can each time and trying to hold it in place. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and catch some of these loose spots. Um, but each time I'm pulling tight because I want it to be as cinched as possible. So I'm just sending the needle in in a bunch of places, pulling tight, and this is, we use the crochet thread because it's really strong. It's not gonna break like the regular sewing thread. So that should be good. And I'll just tie it off, you know, in that excess fabric that's hanging below the threads. And then whenever I'm ready, when I feel like it's secure in there, it's not going anywhere, um, I can just tie it off somewhere. So I'll loop it through a little bit and make a knot just go under and tighten it remember this is all going to be hidden in the opening of my pin cushion holder so um, i'll just cut off leave a little tail maybe and there we go
So now if I have any loose pieces or any um, of walnut shell or on my table here, I can just scoop it all into the bowl for some easy cleanup. Okay. So now I'm just going to get my hot glue gun heating up and then I'll show you how to do the last step. I've tucked the pin cushion in a little bit on each side um, just to make sure I don't have any big gaps and that I like where, how it looks. And so I think I want it to stay about like this. So really, if I were to stick a pin cushion, I'm pressing pretty hard on it, it's not going anywhere. So glue might not be necessary, especially with the walnut shells where it's already firm. Um, but if you want to add a few, like I have this little gap right here, um, I don't want the glue to show, so I want it to go inside, and it's okay if it's touching the fabric or the holder, um, but I'm just going to kind of squeeze some glue in there. Oops, I just noticed there's some glittery red glue that was on the side of my glue stick. I'll have to let that dry and pull that off. Um, my girls were using glitter glue last. So I'm just going to kind of press it into the side to hold there. Will that come off yet? There we go. It's a nice thing about hot glue is it's pretty forgiving. <laughs> All right. And then I'll just look and see, you know, maybe on the back here, put some under here just to hold it in place. Just filling it with glue. And then I'll press it in toward this side. Just kind of squishing it so I'm not pulling away from what I just glued. If your pin cushion isn't quite as large and it feels like it's going to fall in, then you might glue all the way around the edge. Again, the, per the point is to hide the glue though. You don't want it to be visible, so you might put it on the inside lip of the opening, um, but it can touch the fabric or it can touch the holder, but um, I'm gonna call that one good. And then let's do his little friend here. This time we'll do the uh, polyfill. Just give him a little dusting inside. So for this one, um, I really, I really liked this fabric for him, but I figured I just did a blue one, and so I'm gonna get my second favorite choice here, just so I have a little more variety, and I'm gonna go with the pink tulips, which I think will look nice with his little pink tongue too. So because of the rectangular shape here, I'm going to stitch the same way, but in a longer rectangular shape. And this one is just shy of four inches, so I'm gonna want a longer rectangular piece so I have enough gathered here. So I have my fat quarter, I've ironed most of it, and I'm gonna just do the same process except fill it with um, the polyfill this time instead of the crushed walnut shells. And I'm going to make a rectangular shape um, as much as I can here. So same process. So just to give you an idea of how big this piece is, my, um, I said that my opening on my plant holder there was about four inches, and I just am eyeballing, again, erring on larger sizes because I can always cut fabric off, but this is about 12 inches, um, so again, about three times as much, and it's nine inches wide, um, and my width here was about one and a half inches so that should be plenty but again I want enough to gather at the bottom so I'm, I'm just airing on the side of more. This fabric by the way is called Sugar Sack 2 by Wyndham Fabrics but I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking now and just do the same process. <music>
here's the first one all finished. The pins fit nicely in here. That cushion is nice and firm with the crushed walnut shells. And I just thought that this two-tone blue would look nice with the bow that has a few shades of blue in it as well. So you can see all around the different sides here. It's pretty adorable. And here's the second one with the little food dish. I love how it can hold these wonder clips. There's even a little hollow spot in the top of his head that can hold more. And then the cushion, even though it has the polyfill, it's still pretty firm here. And the back, that little hole, I thought would be great for pens or I could even put a pair of scissors in here. So I really like this one because it can just hold so much more. And it just looks really cute with that pink pin cushion in here so let me just spin it around and show you all the sides of it here really happy with how this one turns out and love his sweet little face and his pink tongue hiding back there under the clips i hope you enjoyed seeing these pin cushions come together using antiques it's a great way to repurpose them and just find something that will bring you joy to see sitting on your sewing table or in your sewing room. If you like seeing videos like this, please give me a thumbs up so I know to keep making videos like this one. And you might also want to check out my weekend project playlist to see other quick projects that come together in just a day or two. This one was just um, less than an hour to put together. So I hope next time you're antiquing or you're in a thrift store and you see something that has an opening that you think would be cute in your sewing room, consider getting it and matching it up with some fabric. It's a lot of fun to do and the only limitation is your creativity. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.